Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Effective Implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325, Gender Equality in Peace and Security. We're so excited that you joined Juan for this presentation, and also very excited to hear from Sahana Dharma Puri. My name is Adzi Vokiwa. I am the Senior Program Associate here at WAND, and I'll be running the technology today. Uh, before we start the presentation, just a few housekeeping items. Um, all of the attendees are going to be muted during the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions for Sahana, please ask them by typing them into the question section of your panel on the right-hand side of your screen. When Sahana finishes her presentation, I will ask them aloud to her. If you're having any technical difficulties, please contact GoToWebinar support directly. Their phone number is 1-800-263-6317. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tanya Henderson, our Women, Peace, and Security Public Policy Director. Tanya? Hi, Azzy, thank you, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm so excited that we get to hear from Sahana Damapuri today. Sahana is um, a gender advisor with 15 years of experience providing policy advice and training on gender, peace, and security, um, and particularly to um, organizations such as USAID, NATO, US Institute for Peace, um, you know, developing consulting firms and a number of other NGOs. So we're really fortunate because Sahana has um, expert and, um, you know, implement uh, expert understanding of the implementation of SCR 1325. And more poignantly, how gender uh, blindness, gender perspective, and gender equality matter in really building sustainable peace. Sahana also has um, quite a, a background in academic writing, and her writing on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda has appeared in Christian Science Monitor, Human Rights Quarterly, and the Global Responsibility to Protect Journal, as well as the Senior Professional Journal, journal of the U.S. Army. And she's continued to do trainings at the U.S. State Department um, and, you know, major U.S. combat and command centers. So we're really getting a breadth of information um, from Sahana on how to address this aspect um, in ensuring that our women, peace, and security agenda is effectively implemented. So on that note, I'm really going to turn us over to Sahana so we can um, hear her presentation today. And, and I'm excited to learn so much. So Sahana? Thanks, Tanya. And um, thank you to Juan for inviting me to speak with, to you today. And thanks to all of you who are taking the time to participate in the seminar today. I know that there's a lot of experienced people participating today. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation after the presentation. So what I'm going to share with you today is based on two years of interviews with about 100 men and women who have served as either peace negotiators, peace mediators, military advisors, gender advisors, member state representatives and UN officials, and of course extensive desk research about the challenges of implementing the women, peace and security agenda. And I want to say from the outset that these are my own views and I'm not speaking on behalf of any government, organization, or institution. I am a practitioner, and as Tanya said, my work largely focuses on working within government and military institutions on women, peace, and security and implementing UN Security Council Resolution 1325. I'm going to take about 25 minutes to talk to you about why the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda is an important foreign policy tool to de-escalate violence, increase protection, and create more peaceful societies, and why effective implementation of it begins with gender equality. But um, first, before we jump in, oops, sorry, um, I'm just going to give you a quick session overview. Um, I'm briefly going to go over the background of Women, Peace, and Security. Then I'm going to touch on the problem of slow implementation and briefly discuss what the research shows, and then talk a little bit about what international actors need to do to fully execute their policy commitments. So last week, U.S. Ambassador Samantha Power made a statement at the U.N. Security Council open debate on women, peace, and security, saying that 
Security Council Resolution 1325 affirmed that women's participation in matters of international security and peace is vital. But what does that mean exactly? That's kind of a big statement. In order to understand what the Women, Peace, and Security agenda is about and why it is vital, we have to look at where it came from. The Women, Peace, and Security agenda was brought to the international stage by women who were living in conflict zones and who were working to end the violence that they were experiencing. Women's organizations from Sierra Leone, Guatemala, Somalia, Tanzania, and Namibia laid the groundwork for policy debates at the highest levels of the international system to address the marginalization of women in peace building and reconstruction. And these women pointed out that peace agreements that took so long to negotiate were prone to failing at least 50% of the time. They pointed out that peacekeepers sent to halt conflict violence in transition countries sometimes acted as perpetrators of violence against the communities they were meant to serve. And they noted that constitution drafting and other forms of state architecture, which are intended to serve all citizens of the newly formed state, did not guarantee the rights of all citizens and often struck down some fundamental rights of half the population in that transition state. So what the women did was they called for international actors to examine not only what they were saying, but what they were actually doing. And they pointed to the need for the international community to engage in some critical self-reflection about how they were and are doing security and peace. And as a result of their efforts, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security was unanimously passed in October 2000. And it was the first time the Security Council recognized that international peace and security cannot be achieved without the full participation of both men and women, and it can't be achieved without equality between men and women. So I'm just going to very briefly go over the basic content of 1325. It has four pillars that focus on participation, protection, prevention, and gender mainstreaming. And its main goals are to reduce violence, increase protection, stop the perpetuation of gender inequality, and to promote equality between men and women. And this slide that I'm showing you right now is a short list of the resolutions and some of the policies that have emerged from the Women, Peace, and Security agenda since 2000. Most recently, we've had the uh, passage of Resolution 2122 last week on women's peace leadership. And it's really important to underscore that human rights and thus women's rights are embedded in all of these resolutions and policies. But the problem is that while we have an increasing number of these Security Council resolutions and national action plans and even agency policies on women, peace, and security, the implementation of these resolutions and policies has been slow. All of the actors that I interviewed said that they faced significant challenges in putting the policy into practice. Um, to date, the international focus has been on two areas of Women, Peace, and Security, the agenda has it's been focusing on increasing the numbers of women in peace negotiations and peacekeeping and on addressing sexual violence and armed conflict. But the research shows, interestingly, that the focus on increasing women's representation, like just focusing on the numbers of women and focusing on women's victimization in armed conflict by addressing sexual violence, has actually obscured the gender biases of international actors that create institutionalized resistance to fully implementing this agenda. And so that's sort of a mouthful. What does that mean? It means that people within government and military institutions have their own gender biases that influence how effectively they can implement these policies and resolutions. And this might seem like common sense, but it was very striking that in the course of the 100 interviews, a repeating theme occurred among all the interviewees in these five common statements that kept reappearing that I'm showing to you on the screen here. And the theme is really a deeply entrenched personal gender bias, not an evidence-based bias about 
women's expertise and status, women's participation in international security and peace, and the value of equality between men and women to matters of international peace and security. These statements that you're looking at shed light on the limited support and understanding of the women, peace, and security agenda within these institutions, and also tell us why implementation is so slow. These common statements show that resistance to gender equality actually originates with the individuals within institutions of defense, diplomacy, and development. And most often, this appears as the stories that the people within these institutions tell about what we can know, what we can improve, and what we can take immediate action on with regard to security and peace. So in other words, the resistance to gender equality within the institutions by these individuals weakens the capacity of governments, government organizations, to carry out their own policy commitments. So if that's the problem, what, what's the solution? How do we address these gender biases that act as this major barrier? Well, let's look to the work that's already been done on the ground. The research shows that effective implementation of women, peace, and security starts with applying what's called a gender perspective. So what is a gender perspective? First, I just want to say very briefly that gender is about the social roles of men and women. It's about the power relationships between men and women based on these social expectations and norms. And so a gender perspective is the examination or the taking into account of the different roles, status, needs, and priorities of men and women and boys and girls and asking how these differences will impact the policy, program, or legislation being considered or implemented. And I'm going to come back to how to apply a gender perspective in a little while, but first let's talk about what happens if we don't do this. Because we know that inequities between men and women can negatively impact their access to health and education services, to employment opportunities, their access to decision-making fora, and access to protection and enforcement of legal rights. If we don't use a gender perspective, that is, if we don't consider the different experiences of men and women and how it's likely to impact our policies and programs, it leads to gender blindness. And gender blindness means that we're not examining how gender biases and inequalities between men and women can impact the outcomes of our programs and policies. Gender blindness can impact international peace and security in at least two ways. Um, there are many ways it impacts it, but I'm just going to share a few examples on these two ways. Um, because this came up a lot in the research as well, in the interviews and the research. So first, it results in ad hoc measures, not strategic efforts to implement the women, peace, and security agenda, such as holding separate women's conferences about constitution drafting or coalition building, for example, which is fine because we do want to consult with women. But what the problem with that is, is that these are ad hoc and they're not integrated into the main and officially recognized negotiations. So women's recommendations might be collected, but they are not used in decision making. Second, it results in poor data collection and analysis because the information on men and women and boys and girls who are affected is not being systematically collected or analyzed, which means we can only make decisions on partial information, not the full picture. And here are some examples. Um, let's just start with the ad hoc measures. And here's two examples. One is from the Middle East peace process, and the other is going to be from the 2005 Sudan negotiation. And as I'm talking, you'll probably think of similar things happening today in the context of Syria or Libya or Afghanistan. So in the Middle East uh, peace process, for example, um, in 2010, Special Envoy George Mitchell met with members of the International Women's Commission to listen to their recommendations and perspectives um, from Israeli and Palestinian women about the negotiation. However, 
even though the women asked to be included in the negotiations, the quartet said that our mandate does not cover issues related to women. So this is really strange. Since all the members of the quartet were parties to the passing of 1325 in the year 2000, and furthermore, and not least, I should say, it is strange since women are actually half of the population, at least, of both parties to the conflict. Another example of this, of how individual gender biases can act as institutional resistance to implementing women, peace, and security, is from the 2005 Sudan peace negotiations. Although women were included in the talks, they were really included as tokens. They were routinely left out of the main discussions. And in some cases, women were forced to present their recommendations to the parties by actually pushing their documents under the closed door of the negotiation room. One of the delegates, Dr. Ann Ito, describes her experience in detail in an article that she wrote called guests at the table, which you might like to read. It's available online. Um, a second way that gender Im blindness impacts policymaking is due to the lack of sex disaggregated data. And I mentioned before that a lack of consideration of both men and women's different experiences in conflict can result in poor data collection and analysis of the problem. So what's the missing data? We're talking about sex disaggregated data. And what is sex disaggregated data? Well, for example, we can look at the following numbers I've put on the screen and look at the information here about men and women's literacy rates. It's disaggregated by sex. There's men, and then there's women. Um, the numbers tell us the number of literate women increased from 1970 to 1975. But what doesn't it tell us? It doesn't tell us why it increased, and it doesn't tell us why there are still more literate men in 1975 than literate women. So we need the numbers to uncover the discrepancy in literacy, but then we need to ask questions about what's different about men and women's experiences that help or hinder their ability to become literate. That's an example of the kind of information that's missing from um, our data collection. So now I'm going to share with you two examples of how the lack of this kind of information weakens the implementation of programs and policies that are meant to reduce violence and create more peaceful societies. So the first example is from truth commissions. Um, an eight country study of truth commissions found that the past truth commissions and fact-finding bodies did not adequately include gender issues in questionnaires and forms that were used to collect data and testimonies from survivors. And so basically, the study concluded that this actually weakened the ability of the programs to address the gender-based and sexual violations of um, people. And this is particularly important because there were, it disadvantaged those people who were children at the time that they were victimized. But the thing is that truth commissions are meant to clarify the facts about past human rights violations. They're meant to provide evidence that they gather into continuing and new investigations and criminal proceedings. And they're meant to help formulate effective recommendations for providing full reparations to all the victims. And so the point is that if we don't get the right information, about the men and women, boys and girls, we cannot come up with effective programs to resolve these conflicts. The second example, which is, um, again, the problem of missing data, is extending into this emerging issue of countering violent extremism as well. And the slide I have in the title says counter terrorism and CVE. CVE stands for countering violent extremism. According to studies done on USAID's counterterror and countering violent extremism programs and policy, sex disaggregated data, that is the information being collected on both sexes, is actually not systematically being collected and analyzed. Instead, the focus has been on young men exclusively. So it is highly gendered, but it's focused on young men. 
and sometimes a focus on mother's roles to influence their sons has also been included. But data on men and women, boys and girls, is not being systematically collected or analyzed when considering how to counter violent extremism. And furthermore, consultation with women's organizations, female law enforcement officers, and other female experts has not yet been undertaken to understand these problems. And so the problem with this is that, and the impact is that, even though women's organizations are at the forefront of preventing and resolving conflict and fostering intercommunal dialogue to resolve conflict, these, these types of peace building efforts and pro, um, programs are directly related to countering violent extremism, but they're not being taken into account. And the policies that exclusively focus on young men leave little support for these important peace building programs. And furthermore, some policy documents actually caution against supporting women's rights and equality due to fears of a backlash against so-called Western values. But I have to say that terrorism is most successful when it creates fear. And so what does, where does that leave us? It leaves us with silence and inaction. And the problem is that silence and inaction about these biases allow them to perpetuate. And the lack of good data does not help us identify the multiple courses of action that may be available to us to fully support and enforce the rule of law for everyone, both men and women. And really, the fact is that you, the U.S. Foreign Assistance Act mandates the inclusion of women in U.S. foreign assistance programming and supports the goal of gender equality in U.S. foreign policy. And this is because if we don't collect the right data and analyze the problem with all the information, we won't make good policy decisions. A good part of that missing data is about how men and women are differently affected by conflict and by our policies in conflict and post-conflict situations. So um, I've just shared with you three or four examples of how gender blindness of government and military actors impacts and weakens foreign policy and foreign assistance programs to meet their goals and co policy commitments. So the question is, what do we do about it? Um, and this brings us back to using a gender perspective, and this is a really great analytical tool. And let me reiterate this, because effective implementation of women, peace, and security begins with a gender perspective. This requires the consideration of both men and women, boys and girls, and their different experiences, needs, roles, and status in society. So how do you actually do that? Um, it sounds complicated, but it actually isn't. I'm going to give you a tool that you can use anytime. So first, again, I'm going to say the word gender is a loaded term, and people do often equate it with women. But having a gender perspective means that you're also considering the men, because gender is actually about the relationship between men and women. And applying a gender perspective means considering both the experiences of men and women in any given policy or program, and it means asking yourself the right questions so that you have a clear understanding of how what you do affects a population as a whole, either negatively or positively. So here are a few simple questions that you can ask yourself every time you want to know how policy or program might affect men and women differently and how effective your policy might be you know, depending on the gender roles and, and relations in society that you're uh, working with. So here's five basic questions to ask. The first, do you have sex disaggregated data? What we just talked about. Do you have a breakdown of what's happening with the men and the women and the boys and the girls in your data set? Second is, do you know about the traditional gender roles um, that affect men and women in this situation? Do you know what men and women's legal rights are in this situation? Are there any disparities in the resources and opportunities that men and women can access? Um, it's true in the 
peace negotiation examples I gave you that women were being consulted, they were being included, but they didn't really have decision-making authority. They didn't really have an opportunity to present their recommendations and perspectives equally. And what are the different needs of men and women in this situation? So those five questions are pretty basic and you can get more complicated with the information that you find in them, but they're really handy um, when you want to apply a gender perspective. So I've given you a bunch of examples of what happens when we don't include a gender perspective. We talked about gender blindness a lot. Now I want to give you some examples of why or what happens when a gender perspective is applied. And I'm going to use the example of peace operations here because there's an emerging body of evidence that shows that using a gender perspective in peace operations increases its effectiveness in a couple of key ways. Um, it improves the situational awareness of peace operations and helps to increase protection for the local population. It improves the credibility of peace operations and it also improves team performance. So first, the UN and NATO have done many studies that have shown that gender perspective enhances situational awareness of the operation because gathering information from men, women, boys, and girls in an affected population results in a more nuanced and comprehensive understanding of that area. Um, as former force commander Patrick Khmer said, being able to talk to the female and male leaders in the community is vitally important because female community leaders have important information that is key to addressing security challenges in conflict. And you know, having female interpreters on things like joint protection teams that the UN sometimes uses in places like the Congo has been really important to prevent more, more attacks of sexual violence and to help protect local populations. Um, second, gender perspective enhances force acceptance and credibility because they found that having female police officers, um, police peacekeepers I should say, were seen as less threatening and they were able to diffuse potentially violent situations more effectively than their male counterparts. And this trust in the female peacekeepers built trust in the UN missions to do its job. And third, there are also very interesting studies from both the military and the private sector that show that teams with equal numbers of men and women actually perform better than single sex teams. And the slide I'm showing you here is a little summary of the private sector study that was done on 100 teams in 17 different countries that showed that teams with equal numbers of men and women had really interesting outcomes um, and were able to perform at a much higher level. So I've given you a lot of information here, um, and I hope I haven't talked too fast, um, but I just want to wrap up to reiterate some of the key points that you've gone over. And I, I want to say that to make very clear that women's rights are already embedded in the policies and the resolutions that we have on women, peace, and security. But we have to actually implement these policies in order to realize the rights. And effective implementation of these resolutions and policies starts with a gender perspective. And the fact that government and military actors do not have the capability of using a gender perspective yet, I should say, to fully carry out their policy commitments can be understood as a strategic blind spot for us. And also, the hidden gender biases within institutions act as barriers for us to collect information on both men and women, to actually comprehensively analyze the problems that we face and to effectively address these problems. If we want to decrease violence and increase protection and build more peaceful societies, we must address the hidden and not so hidden gender biases within our institutions. Government and military actors need to build their capacity to use a gender perspective in order to fulfill the resolutions that the Security Council keeps passing.
it's great that we have all these resolutions, but we need to be able to also implement them. So what are some key action points and takeaways? Well, I have two, um, because I think we can address the strategic blind spot. We can make the gender biases of international actors visible so that men and women are more free to find alternative solutions. And without a directly addressing gender biases of people within government and military institutions, we can't really implement the policies and resolutions that we already have. And secondly, that means we have to increase international actors' effectiveness through training on how to apply a gender perspective to their daily work. So my closing thoughts are basically that it, it is very important to acknowledge the efforts that have been made to advance the Women, Peace, and Security agenda and to recognize all the resolutions and policies and national action plans that we have. These have set a normative environment where we can actually discuss the link between gender equality and security in the first place. But I do believe that the fundamental solution to this problem requires challenging the biases that enable and justify inequality between men and women. Human rights to life and dignity must be protected everywhere from all kinds of threats. And I think that using a gender perspective in international security and peace is one way to do that. So I want to say thank you very much for listening, and um, I am looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Sahana. That was very thorough and very helpful. And uh, I know our audience has a lot of questions. Um, and just want to remind you to type them using the question box on your attendee panel, and then I'll ask them aloud to Sahana. Uh, but before we take questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Tanya really quickly, and she'll just give a quick uh, wrap up. Tanya? Great. Thank you, Wesley. And thank you so much, Sahana. That was um, really informative, and I think it took us all a, little, a deeper level in our implementation of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. And, um, you know, for bringing it back into our U.S. policy agenda, I believe, you know, many of you know that we do have a U.S. national action plan to implement 1325. It was introduced via executive order by President Obama in 2011. And, um, and if we were to implement it effectively, we um, would absolutely be apply applying um, a gender perspective. Um, but it sounds like we still have quite a bit of work to do. So to ensure that we can get that work done, we need to, um, you know, pass the Women, Peace, and Security Act, which would in, uh, give Congress oversight of implementation of the NAP. So there's really a lot that we can do um, from a U.S. policy perspective, and I think that Sahana has showed us why it's so important that we make sure that our own U.S. foreign policy is applying this gender perspective. So I just feel so grateful today that, Sahana, you shared this, and I'm sure that we're going to have many questions that can help us get a, a deeper understanding of how to, how to really um, advance this agenda you know, effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and take some questions from our audience. Uh, the first question is from Miriam Rakib. Uh, Miriam asks, with respect to Afghanistan, please comment on the role of the NGO realm influencing in a positive man manner or challenging implementation of SCR 1325. Okay. Um, well, as you know, Mir thanks, Miriam, for your question. Um, there are a lot of really great NGOs working on the ground. And I have to say that um, in Afghanistan and in many other countries, it is the NGO sector, the civil society sector, that is really leading the implementation of women, peace, and security on the ground um, and making the most headway. But it's very challenging for them because they're relying on the government and, don't, and international donors for support to continue their work. And if the people within those government institutions are not really understanding or able to 
grasp the significance of the work of those local NGOs, such as the ones you're mentioning in Afghanistan, um, it's really hard for those people on the ground to continue implementation of women, peace, and security in a, in a meaningful and significant way. And some of the barriers that I mentioned with the Middle East peace process negotiation and the Sudan negotiation are very similar to the same barriers you'll see in including women in the Afghan negotiations or including women in the Syrian coalition where there have been a lot of efforts to bring women to the table. I know WIND has supported a lot of work on bringing women parliamentarians together to discuss issues in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, but one of the challenges, really big challenges that we face is how do we get these important recommendations and insights and experiences integrated into the main event of the negotiations and the high-level discussions at the track one level. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I hope it gives some background on the challenges that civil society faces on the ground. Thank you, Sahana. Um, our next question is from Elaine Noneman. Elaine asks, are there any narrative type studies you know of using pictures or video of conflict or development problems having men and women state their approaches to solutions? Well, um, there are definitely a lot of visual and uh, social media um, projects that are coming up now, and I have to say that um, the work on engaging men, I don't know if people are familiar with that, but there is a, a whole um, emerging body of work on how to engage men in thinking about alternative masculinities, alternative um, ideas about how men use power and to stop men, men stopping men from using violence against women. And those uh, campaigns do have a lot of um, visual uh, aids and, and short films that are available online. You could check out um, engaging, I think it's called the Engaging Men Alliance or menengage.org. There's also Promundo that does a lot on fatherhood and has some very good videos of actual participants in their program from Rwanda and from Brazil, South Africa, of how men's attitudes have changed um, about their wives or their partners and about their roles as fathers and their understanding of gender equality. And I also know that there are some really interesting um, cartoons that uh, in Pakistan that are um, being done. One is called the Burqa Avengers, which is a countering violent extremism uh, program. It's a cartoon for children. And it's, uh, I think it is subtitled. You could probably find it on YouTube as well. Wow, that's interesting. We'll definitely have to check out that cartoon. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, our next question is from Kathleen Schneider. Uh, Kathleen says, in your experience, should training with the goal of organizational change start top down or bottom up? Okay. Hi, Kathleen. I think I know which Kathleen Schneider this is. Hello. <laughs> um, thanks for joining. Um, training top down or bottom up? Um, I, I think that it has to be both. It has to be simultaneous. I think if you do the top, if you do the bottom half, that's great. People have the capacity but to, to do the work, but their leaders, their leadership may not understand the importance of it and therefore may not always be supportive of doing that type of work. And I think that what I've seen is when both the leader or the leadership of an organization understand the importance of gender perspective and gender equality in their work, and they make it a priority for their whole organization to learn how to do it, that's when it works the best. Um, because otherwise you're kind of lopsided. If you just have a leader that is really um, a champion of these issues, that's great. They will get a lot done, but what happens when they leave? or they are the ambassador and then they're only there for a few years and they rotate out of the mission. You don't have the institutional capacity anymore in the mission and it's sort of left up to sort of 
the vagaries of chance of who comes in next. So, um, and fortunately or unfortunately, I think you have to do both top and bottom. All right, thank you. Um, and our next question is from Terry Givens. Terry asks, uh, when you speak of actors, do you mean performing skits with live actors portraying biases and problems? Okay. Hi, Terry. Um, thanks for your question. So that's a good question, actually, because I really struggled with how to refer to the people who are within um, institutions like the UN or within the State Department or within civil society organizations or within NATO. And they're all on the international stage of sorts, right? And they're political, they're military, they're security um, people, but they're all acting together. And so I was referring to, when I said international actors and international community, I'm talking about the people who are in those institutions, like the UN or the State Department or in NATO, for example, or peacekeepers, countries that contribute peacekeepers, for example. I hope that clarifies. I think so. Um, all right, our next question is from Catherine Ronderos. Uh, Catherine says, it's becoming common in a very narrow approach uh, to implement 1325 by including women in the military but there's a complex discussion from the women's movement on not promoting women into the military and war. How can we change this approach? Okay, um, let me just clarify. So you're saying we, that there's a big push to include women in the military, but there's also the feeling of like, well, we don't want to just include women to go fight in wars. I, I think that's the question. Is that as you um, can well, I think also the, uh, the question is asking more about them not being promoted into leadership. Oh, not being, Just yes. sort of asking to be participants without leadership roles. Right, okay. Yeah, so um, I completely agree with you. I think that, um, again, if we use a gender perspective on combat integration, what we would find is instead of saying we need to include women in the military, um, what we would be starting to ask is, well, which women, what are they doing, what are their roles, what rank are they at, how easy is it for them or hard is it for them to be promoted up the ranks um, and have access to decision-making roles, and how are they respected in those roles of decision-making authority. Um, and I do take your point about um, not including women in the military because of not wanting to promote um, war or something like that. But I also think that you know when you look at say U UN peacekeeping and their effort to try to include more women in peacekeeping miss missions, which are not missions that are going off to fight wars, they're actually sending people to try to de-escalate the violence and try to contain and stabilize um, these conflict countries. Women have a really important role to play in that as peacekeepers, as police, and as soldiers and military observers, but also it's very important for the men in these militaries to also use a gender perspective on their work. So if we use a gender perspective on this problem of combat integration, it wouldn't just be a focus on women. We would also be asking about the men and what are the men doing, and how are men and women relating to each other in this environment. And then you get to your question, you'd be able to start answering the question about women's ranks and their promotion to leadership positions. All right, our uh, next question is from Senator Nan Oroff, and she asks, is it typical for a UN resolution to encounter such difficulty and so many bar barriers in being fully supported and implemented? Are there any helpful examples from the past? Okay, well, that's a really good question. Thanks for that one. Um, 
Well, I think that the UN uh, 1325 is unique in, in its challenges. And I think it is precisely because it is about gender equality. I think that there are a lot of policies, foreign policy, um, foreign policies that we've undertaken that have not come up against this much scrutiny for 10 or 13 years before they've been implemented. Um, so I don't think it's typical of other resolutions. On the other hand, there are a lot of resolutions that are being passed. I mean, last week was the 2,122nd resolution, right, that have been passed. And we can say the UN member states are, have challenges in agreeing to do things and implementing. And there's a limited budget, and there's limited number of people, and political will on many issues. Um, but I think that this issue of women, peace, and security is unique in that there is a gender bias that's prevalent in every um, situation that we encounter. So are there other examples that we could learn from? I mean, I think that the example that the women who championed 1325 set for us is a very high bar. If you think about it, those women had no government. I mean, they had no position. They had no authority, really. They weren't political leaders. They're civil society members. They had no money. They, I mean, they didn't come from you know a place that had tons of money supporting their agenda. They have no military. They have no arms. They didn't use force. And yet, they succeeded in doing something quite extraordinary in bringing their voice and this issue of gender equality to international security decision making. And so I think, to me, that's one of the finest examples of what we can achieve if we really focus on the bigger picture and not just counting numbers and not just limited um, interpretations of problems that we have. Um, all right, our next question um, is asking, so can this um, idea of you know, gender equality um, and tactics for implementation be useful at home? Uh, while we're trying to use this in our foreign policy, it seems there's more and more sexism here at home. Yeah, well, yes, I definitely think, I mean, I, I, mean, I think a gender perspective can be applied to anything. And yes, we can apply it to the problems that we have here in our education system, in our health services, in our um, jobs. I mean, if you, there are some really interesting articles that have come out in the last year or so on, like last Christmas there was something on, which is not a policy problem, but it's an interesting uh, way of using a gender perspective, where I think some toy, major toy companies in this country started to notice that hey, there's more dads being involved with the child care. Um, and the, they started to change the uh, things that were considered traditional roles for girls, like Barbie's you know, dress-up toys. They made them into construction workers or toys that dads could actually um, feel more comfortable sharing with and playing with their children as the primary caregiver. So I think there there are really interesting examples in the private sector in this country, and I think for using a gender perspective. And I think, yes, definitely we could be applying that more to the public policies that we have. All right, thank you. Um, OK, so our last question um, is from uh, a recent attendee to our Will Wand conference that we had here in Washington, D.C., and they said, uh, I learned when we were meeting with members on Capitol Hill that there is Republican support as well as Democratic support for addressing international violence against women. Is this a cause for optimism going forward that we could build bipartisan support in the U.S. for addressing these gender issues? Um, 
Well, I, I can say a little bit about it, but maybe Tanya would probably also like to weigh in on the IAVA stuff and the, and the Women, Peace, and Security Act. Um, I do think it's positive to have the Democrats and Republicans agree on something. <laughs> um, and I think that um, it, is, it is very good that they are putting their support behind the Violence Against Women Act, for sure. I hope that it translates into support for women, peace, and security as well, and the implementation of the U.S. National Action Plan. And maybe, Tanya, you might be able to weigh in a little bit more on that. Sure. Um, thanks again, Sahana. So in regards to the Women, Peace, and Security um, Act, it is, it's, it's a, a bill, legislation. It was introduced in the House um, in late July. To, to really codify the U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. So it's, it's to make implementation of the U.S. National Action Plan law, law of the land. And, um, but the reason I think that there's a real rare opportunity, um, rare at least in, in, in this Congress, to, to increase bipartisan support of this is because the U.S. National Action Plan um, applies to all federal agencies in the government um, that are really dealing with matters of peace and security. So the Department of Defense has an implementation plan of the, the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. U.S. State Department does, USAID does, um, Homeland Security and Justice, all are responsible for implementing this agenda. So when you start talking about that you've got these very, even you know trade and, and treasury, right? So when you've got these various federal agencies that have that by our current administrative policy have to um, apply the women, peace, and security agenda um, and are supposed to be applying this gender perspective internally, then um, you know, uh, Congress on all sides really needs to have oversight. And if the Women, Peace, and Security Act of 2013 would pass, um, it would require um, under the National Action Plan, comprehensive you know, training programs on the value of women's participation in conflict prevention and all relevant um, diplomatic defense and, and development work. Um, it would also, you know, going back to Sahana's discussion around, um, you know, the um, sex disaggregated data, the WPS Act would require the head of each of these agencies, so DOD, state, USAID, it would require them to identify common indicators um, to evaluate the impact of U.S. foreign assistance um, on women's inclusion and participation. So because it's really this government, the U.S. National Action Plan is a government-wide approach, um, you know, Congress then wants oversight, whether it's the taxpayer dollars, you know, how they're being spent to implement this agenda, you know, or it's, um, you know, providing um, uh, humanitarian assistance to crises and disasters. You know, all of these um, really can uh, spread out into various aspects of our members of Congress. So um, we are having a good response, as you experienced, um, on increasing bipartisan support. We're not fully there yet, but, but we're definitely getting there, and it is positive. Well, on that positive note, I think we're going to uh, go ahead and wrap up this webinar. just wanted to say thank you to all of our uh, participants who took the time to join us this afternoon. A special thank you to Sahana Dharmapuri for her very thorough and very enlightening presentation. Uh, please be on the lookout for some follow-up materials from us. Uh, a survey will be coming in your email tomorrow, uh, so just give us any feedback you have about the webinar on that survey. And also wanted to give you all a heads up uh, that we will be holding a three-part webinar series later this winter on social media. So uh, please also keep an eye on your email for the dates and times of those presentations. And uh, this presentation was recorded, and so we'll be sending out uh, a rec the link to the recording to you as well. Uh, thanks again, and I hope you join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you.